First flight on PV3 was a very significant milestone in my flight testing career. And as you all know, it's, uh, it's a great honor for any test pilot to be involved in a prototype flight testing program. And then to be able to fly a prototype for the very first time is, is, is a very significant milestone indeed. The work up to the first flight to PV3 was uh, also a very exciting phase. We had numerous meetings under the leadership of uh, then Air Commodore R.K. Sharma, who recently retired as an Air Marshal, who was heading uh, the National Flight Test Center. Uh, he, he would organize what were called what-if meetings wherein we debated at length as to what to do if something went wrong, something didn't go according to plan, so on and so forth. We did a lot of flight testing, or I wouldn't say flight testing, ground testing on the Iron Bird. The Iron Bird is a facility at Aeronautical Development Agency and HAL wherein the aircraft's uh, hydraulics, its various jacks, its flight controls, everything are simulated and we run through what are called fault-free tests. Once we are satisfied that the fault-free tests are satisfactory is when we go ahead to the next step. And then we did a lot of uh, practice on the real uh, uh, RTS, that's a real-time simulator at NEL, which uh, very, very faithfully uh, duplicates the flying characteristics of the aircraft itself. And uh, as you would all expect, the first flight went flawlessly. For me, it was no surprise, but uh, exciting all the very same. And uh, the aircraft uh, is a lot different from the earlier versions, that is the uh, technology demonstrators and the PV-1. You yourself said that uh, the avionics were representative of the uh, actual uh, aircraft which was to enter service with the Air Force. It had a third multifunction display, it had an open architecture computer, an upfront control display and so on and so forth. All said and done, a very successful first flight and a very exciting first flight. At the outset, I'd say that this missile firing on PV-1 was probably the most significant milestone in the uh, program itself because this was the very first time that the aircraft was being uh, used as a weapon platform. We had done a lot of flight testing with regard to stability and control, the flight control system itself, various onboard avionics and so on and so forth. And uh, the build-up to the first firing of the R-73 on PV-1 was also just as exciting. Uh, the engineers, the designers at ADA and HL were not too sure what uh, kind of an influence the exhaust plume of the R-73 would have on the composite structures of the LCA, particularly the control surfaces, which uh, would be right behind the jet exhaust or the rocket exhaust of the missile. So what was done was uh, a live R-73 missile was shipped to DRDL at Hyderabad. The warhead and other explosives were removed. The aircraft was strapped onto a concrete platform and the rocket motor was fired. This firing took about uh, six and a half seconds, if I remember correctly, and it was filmed with uh, a great deal of accuracy using infrared cameras, visual cameras, and so on and so forth. This data was then analyzed and uh, we deduced that uh, the aircraft was safe and that the plume wouldn't affect the aircraft structure as such. And uh, we ferried the aircraft to Goa. I think this was the very first time that the aircraft uh, was being flown outside of Bangalore. And uh, INS Hansa received that, uh, us with great enthusiasm. And finally, uh, we had a twin-seat uh, Sea Harrier operating as photo chase, filming the entire operation. The missile firing went off without a hitch. Uh, all that the pilot does is press the button in the cockpit and within a couple of milliseconds, the rocket motor fires and it's away. As to how it feels, what I'd like to say is that every fighter pilot in the Air Force at some point in his career has fired a missile, or maybe two or maybe more if he's lucky. And, uh, the moment the missile uh, ignites and the rocket motor fires, you hear a loud whoosh and then the aircraft jerks and thereafter the missile is gone and the mission is then over. As was brought out, the MiGs, and I would like to specify and say MiG-21s because thereafter we had MiG-23s, MiG-25s, 27s and 29s. So I'll confine myself to the MiG-21 right now. Uh, yes, it was uh, inducted into the Air Force in the early 60s and then it saw a progressive metamorphosis and it underwent a large number of modifications, mainly from the Russian side. And uh, most of my operational flying career was in the MiG-21 and uh, a little bit on the MiG-29 as well. So my heart is very close to this aircraft, which is why you see these three lovely little models over here. And uh, I was also fortunate enough to have been uh, the Indian test pilot deputed to Russia uh, to undertake flight testing on the MiG-21 upgrade program, which is now called the Bison. A very, very successful program in, in, uh, indeed, which gave a new lease of life to what was essentially a platform from the 1960s. 
and uh, I think the most logical progression for the Indian Air Force and for the country is to graduate from the MiG-21 to the LCA. Uh, they share some similarities, both are small aircraft, small little agile aircraft, very very pilot friendly and uh, I think uh, quite appropriate for the role that the Indian Air Force envisages. While uh, the Bison did undergo a major modification in terms of better avionics, better pilot machine interfaces, better weapons, the LCA is uh, a different story altogether. The Tejas in its present form, I think, represents the state of the art insofar as uh, man machine interface is concerned, insofar as composite structures is concerned. And uh, it's a wonderful platform that I think is an ideal replacement for the MiG-21. And uh, in fact, at this age, I envy the youngsters who would be entering the Air Force from now onwards, who will get to fly this wonderful little platform. And I'm sure they will appreciate it a lot more than I did. My tenure with NFTC was uh, very, very uh, interesting, very revealing. And what I'd like to say was, I, I, to be very frank, I did have some apprehensions when I was deputed to the NFTC as to how would I deal with uh, a civilian scientist who's probably never seen a fighter plane in his life, who doesn't understand military aviation. And such doubts did creep into my mind. But as I went along in NFTC, I realized that we had a fantastic bunch of uh, engineers and scientists, both at the Aeronautical Development Agency at HAL, of course, who have a lot of experience in aircraft design, aircraft building, etc. But also all the other ancillary labs such as NAL, ADE and the hundreds of other small uh, industries that supported the program. And what I found was that, uh, like a typical Indian, every single scientist in ADA who had no exposure to military aviation, aviation earlier was very quick on the uptake and in no time would be able to speak the same language that we spoke. And, uh, NFTC was the bridge between the designers and the pilots in the field who would ultimately get to fly this wonderful machine. And uh, the interactions that I had with all these scientists and designers was very, very memorable indeed. And I think I learned a lot more than uh, ever before in my career. And thanks to all of them and thanks to all the hard work that they put in. Working long hours was the norm in those days and I think it still is. And uh, which is why we see the fruits of that labor today in what is certainly an excellent little platform, the Tejas LCA. Our uh, erstwhile Defence Minister, Sri George Fernandes, was a magnificent personality and I was privileged to have been uh, earmarked to fly him in a MiG-21 trainer. His mission was to assuage uh, fears amongst uh, the Air Force community in general and the country as a whole, wherein the MiG-21 was given all kinds of names which I uh, wouldn't like to talk about here because they were absolutely inappropriate. And uh, this particular flight with him was uh, so revealing of his personality because he underwent a full-fledged briefing as any squadron pilot would. And I remember that the AOC in C, the Air Officer Commanding Chief, Air Marshal Gandhi, had come down for the briefing himself. And during the briefing, I had made out a sortie profile consisting of some aerobatic maneuvers wherein the aircraft would be subjected to about four times the acceleration due to gravity, which in pilot pilots is called 4Gs. That's when the air marshal stopped me and he said, stop it, uh, we'll restrict ourselves to 2.5G. And then the defense minister put up in hand and said, uh, air marshal, if you don't mind, I'd like to know what 4G feels like. And so 4G it was. And that uh, cloudy, rainy morning, uh, we did get airborne in a MiG-21. The Defence Minister was extremely receptive and kept asking me questions throughout the flight. He didn't feel airsick, nor did he black out even at 4Gs. And it, altogether, it was an amazing experience flying uh, the gentleman.